So you want to do a big night exterior shot. You want to do the Ferris wheel at night. You want to do a fair. Hey everybody, really quick video here with the new DJI Mini Pro 3, uh, which is currently in Instagram mode, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So, I only got to play with this for a couple of days. The key feature, I only got to do a little bit of testing on. What filmmakers should know about the Mini Pro 3 is that they are, DJI is really stepping up performance on low light. The Mini 2 is an f2.7, now this is an f1.7, and then combining that with a real step up there's now a dual native ISO sensor. I was only able to do a little low light flying this weekend. So um, I went out around dawn, got some stuff around the neighborhood in low light. Low light performance is very good. So it's, you know, one of the reluctances we really have with those really small sensor drones is going out and shooting in low light scenarios. And that's sort of an interesting thing to watch DJI pushing even at the low level. Generally, in the past, you want to do a big night exterior shot, you want to do an establishing shot of the city, you want to do the Ferris wheel at night, you want to do the beach at night, although there's not a lot of light there, so you'll be tricky. But like, you want to do a fair, you want to do something like that, you're going to go out with a Mavic 3, because it's got the bigger sensor, or you're going to go out with the Inspire 2, although that's getting very long in the tooth. So it's nice to see that we're getting some push out of low light from DJI for the Mini 3. The Mini lineup, if you guys don't remember, is the lineup that is specifically designed to fit under 249 grams. Why? So 250 grams is frequently the cutoff for a lot of different rules and regulations, depending upon what certification you're gonna need for what licensing. And so the Mini has always been a tempting drone for filmmakers because first off, 249 grams is really light. So if you wanted to like leave it permanently in your kit bag, so you always have it with you to get like an overhead layout of a scene or to throw in a random drone shot you hadn't planned, it's tempting to go Mini for that. And the image quality, I mean, it's 4K 60p now, the image quality is starting to catch up where it's got some appeal for that. But also the nice thing about that is you don't have to worry as much as you travel from zone to zone about regulations. Because of that ultralight weight, you should be able to fit in a whole bunch of different regulatory markets without needing the same amount of licensing. Now, I still encourage you to check if you're flying to a new country that you've not flown in before, you should still check what the local rules are. But 270 is going to help you out a lot. I mean, 250 is going to help you out a lot in a lot of situations. Now the flip side of all that is it's not the world's most robust feeling drone. Now no drone is going to be super robust but it feels a little less it feels a little less strong it feels a little less robust and tough compared to something like a Mavic 3 or even the Mavic Air 2S which they're going to be made out of thicker plastic they're going to survive a little bit better so it's sort of a debate you want it to take as a filmmaker as to whether or not the Mini is the right fit for like a permanent package solution, especially because the Mavic Air 2S is great. And I suspect now that we've got the Mavic 3 and now we've got the Mini 3 Pro, I suspect before too long there'll be an Air 3. And in terms of the levels, I've always kind of liked the Air because uh, it's not the Mini. They don't have to fight so hard to get under 250 grams, but it's not the 3. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars to get it. I mean, it's usually like 1500 bucks, something like that. And they're packing a lot of great image quality into the air. So the air might have a little bit of benefit. The other thing to remember about these really ultralight drones and what I was really excited to get to test over the weekend is the lightweight drones often have less powerful motors, which means you often end up in this situation where they really struggle on a windy day. Um, and that's the other reluctance I have about something like a Mini is the, the dream of a Mini is You've got it, it's very affordable, you keep it in your kit permanently, it's always there when you need it. There's never a moment where you're like, oh, I wish I brought the drone. It weighs small enough amount that you're always just bringing it with you and you're never thinking about it. And it's, there's a benefit in that. And I gotta say, I flew it in a bunch of wind this morning and like the little wind warning came up on the drone, but like the shots are fine. You will notice it struggle a little bit more to keep things smooth in wind, but I was impressed for how light a drone it was that was able to survive in the wind it did and still get usable shots. Um, I needed to massage them a little bit. There was a little bit of like, oh, I'm planning with the wind here, but I was very impressed that I was able to get those kind of results out of something this light. So I think the Mini is in a really interesting space where it's really catching up. And I think for certain filmmaking applications, it is the tool to have. Like if I were doing 
very uh, rare drone shots. And I really wanted a drone as a, I'm always bringing this to set, it's always part of my scout. It lets me get a great overhead. It lets me preview a crane shot during my scout before I bring the crane out later and it helps me know where to park the crane. The mini is actually kind of tempting for that because you will never pull it out of the bag for weight because the whole package all together, even with batteries and everything, it's just so small and you get such great battery life out of it. The other thing that makes it tempting for that is this amazing little charging kit. Three batteries come on top and wonderfully, it's just a USB-C input. A lot of times with the bigger ones, you've got to have like a dedicated charger with a brick that uses the same little adapter thing that goes on. And um, what's nice about this is, you know, I'm sure most of you at this point travel with like a four port GAN charger or something. I know I certainly, I always have two GAN chargers with me whenever I travel and it's just got four USB ports and I'm charging my laptop, I'm charging my wife's laptop, I'm charging my spare batteries. I'm charging all sorts of stuff by USB and I really like this little like travel brick with the little USB adapter where I don't have to pull out a separate wall wart adapter to charge the batteries. I thought that was really slick. So there's some tempting there. I, if you're 100%, like 98% of my use case is Scout, and then 5% of the time you wanna use it to get shots, I actually think you're gonna get, like if you understand its limitations and those limitations are no longer low light, I think you can get some cool shots out of it. You only have conflict avoidance in the front and in the back and down. You do not have side impact avoidance zones. So uh, it'll, and you can turn impact avoidance off. Obviously, if you want to get too close to free, you can also make a beep or you can have it literally do a bypass. I had some fun with it on bypass mode, trying to fly it into some basketball hoops and it would just gently fly around them. Um, so you know, you go into the Air 2S, you go into the Mavic 3, you're getting more impact avoidance tools, you're getting obviously better image quality, larger sensor. It's, you know, it's always a trade-off in terms of budget. I think if you're like, oh, 50% it's a scouting and life tool, 50% I want to be getting shots with it, you're probably going to want to wait Air 2S. If you're like 80%, I'm getting shots with it, I want to go out, drone up, you're probably talking Mavic 3. They also launched at the same time the new RC remote control, they launched, when they launched the Mavic 3 last year, they launched an RC Pro, which is super slick and has antennas on top and the, they, you can run Instagram, so you can like take a shot and post it to Instagram from the remote while the drone's in the air. Slick shit. Um, the RC is smaller, it's lighter. If you don't need the Instagram-ness of it all, if you're not like posting live to the NC, um, I had fine results without the separate antenna. Um, and I'm flying in New York City, which is a very RF intense experience. Um, and yeah, I mean, I had a lot of, um, it's a great little unit. It's nice to have a built-in screen that's ultra bright. I was flying at day exterior and I was able to see the screen, although it was a little dark. Um, you know, it would have been nice. like, I would probably still use a hood of some sort, but it was really, it was very close to being bright enough to usable, which is still impressive. You've got all of your controls for uh, tilting the camera up and down and changing your orientation and changing your uh, drone mode. And I found it really impressive. The other thing we have to talk about, and I made a separate little video of this, so I'm not gonna hold it up, is the little gimbal here in front can change orientation from vertical video to horizontal video. As far as I can think of, it's the first drone camera I've worked with where I have horizontal video and vertical video um, enabled by changing the, drone, the little gimbal orientation. Also because of the way it's designed, uh, with the cutout in between the forward sensors, you can actually shoot much more upright than you normally can with a drone. Remember Parrot had a big marketing push a couple years ago when they launched a drone. It was like, you can shoot upright. And I was like, I don't know if that's that exciting. I didn't use it that much. I'm sure there's some shot I will need someday where shooting upright is great, but it, it, you know, often above a drone, clouds. But the vertical video thing was exciting. I mean, I deliver a lot of jobs now vertical. Most jobs I deliver vertical, we still shoot horizontal and then we do sort of the cross master, but it's something to be aware of is out there in the space. So the Mini 3 is launching today. I think filmmakers should be aware of it, especially if you book a job that's like, I am delivering vertical on this job and I wanna do a lot of drone work. The fact that it can do native vertical is something to be very aware of. Um, it, despite being as small and light as it is, it, hence, it held up pretty well to some pretty windy conditions. It's starting to see some obstacle avoidance and collision avoidance tools roll in, although not all of the ones that you might get on a bigger drone. In general, a little, an incredibly impressive little unit. Oh, and then the last thing they did that was really smart is if you don't need 
to be under 250 grams. You can also buy more powerful batteries. The normal battery that gets you under the 250 gram weight limit uh, lets you fly for about 34 minutes, but there's a battery that gets you up over 40 minutes, but breaks the 250 gram weight limit. So depending upon what your jurisdiction is, there's a little bit of freedom into not having to worry as much about your restrictions in terms of part 107 in the USA and licensing and all that stuff. Um, I still think most filmmakers want to, might want to bump up to an ARS. Uh, I mean, an Air 2S or an Air 3, whenever that comes, I think. And if you're doing a lot of drone work, obviously, you're going to go for the Mavic 3. But I think there's an interesting use case for certain filmmaking applications to something that's so small, you can just always have it with you. All right, so be sure to like and subscribe and come back for more videos. And in the comments, talk to me about what kind of more videos you would like to see. I'm doing some other cool stuff coming up, and I'll make videos about it and share it as it goes.